Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. This one comes from Los Angeles. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play the video. I have to skip through a little bit of this because it's mostly a bunch of public relations stuff within Los Angeles. And then I will go back and I will talk about things that I think that were done right and things that I thought that were done wrong. Without further ado, here we go of Media Relations Division of the Los Angeles Police Department. I'm going to give you a brief overview of an incident that occurred on June 5, 2019 at around 4.50 p.m. in Hollenbeck area. Officers assigned to Hollenbeck area gang enforcement details saw a vehicle with tinted windows and conducted a traffic stop. A male passenger ran from the vehicle and the officers chased him on foot. The male was later identified as 27-year-old Jose Abel Iribe. Here is digital in-car video from that traffic stop. Most marked vehicles assigned to patrol have As Iribe ran from the vehicle, he was holding a handgun. The officers repeatedly told Iribe to stop, but he did not comply. That's when the officer-involved shooting occurred. After being shot, Iribe threw the handgun over a fence, where detectives later recovered it. While officers were attempting to take Iribe into custody, he continued to refuse to follow the officer's commands. A taser was used, and Iribe was taken into custody. He was transported to a local hospital where he received medical treatment for a gunshot wound. Here is video footage from the officer's body-worn cameras. Oh, 
Alright, sure. get him up. We gotta get. We have an RA coming? Twenty-five. We got a gun over on the other side of this fence. Hey, we need another one. We have another gun on the other side of this bin. We have, a, we have another gun over here. Hey, man, we're getting you an ambulance, okay? Stay with us. The handgun Iriba threw over the fence is captured here in this freeze frame from the video. There's gonna be a vehicle, it's gonna be a, a white Toyota Camry. All units, additional on the house call, Myers and Kearney, so it's six of the white Toyota Camry, license for Edward Ocean Lover 842. Give me the other arm! Uh, was the last seen uh, parking at a Myerson Kearney? I don't know if anyone uh, east wind, uh, northbound or southbound. Get him up, we gotta get. We have an RA coming? Forge your statement. Maybe you have a maybe you have an RA for a male. Uh, not crash, not breathing. Uh, suffering for uh, we got a gun over on the other side of this fence. Hey, there, there was a white car. They were parked. Um, my, part, my, car, my car is right in front of me, dude. There, there's a white car. Um, it's like I'm the, in front of my car. It's right there, bro. You like, secure it? Yeah. The firearm found on the other side of the fence was a 45 caliber handgun. It was booked as evidence by investigators. Iriba is a 27-year-old resident of Los Angeles with a criminal history of domestic violence. Iriba is a documented gang member as well. The Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office filed one count of assault with a deadly weapon, felon with a gun, charge of domestic violence, and criminal LAPD will continue to investigate and analyze this incident. They'll continue. All right. <clears throat> so let's head back to the beginning. So for whatever reason, 
this guy, and I'm trying to pause it right at the right moment, but sometimes that just doesn't happen. Anyway, you can see a flashlight in his left hand. So for whatever reason, during bright daytime, he has a flashlight in his hand. And he has this flashlight when he gets out of the car. I don't fully understand why he has a flashlight in bright daylight. Maybe they were planning to pull some super trooper jokes on the guy. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. Now, granted, you can use obviously flashlights during the daytime, help you look under objects and things like that. Um, I don't know what this guy planned on doing with the flashlight during broad daylight. But whatever the reason he had that thing, he kept it in his hand for whatever reason. And he decided to draw his gun. And when he drew his gun, he never got rid of the flashlight. And now he is attempting to get a two-handed grip with a flashlight in his left hand. That flashlight is doing him no good right now. He essentially has a one-handed grip. It may appear as though he's trying to get a two-handed grip, but he does not have a two-handed grip. He might as well just take his left hand all the way down and aim with, the, with just the right hand. I would suspect that when the adrenaline kicked in, he just didn't think about the flashlight being in his left hand. And you will see this from time to time in different videos. Some people hold keys. In their left hand, um, I have saw one video where a person had a radio in their left hand. Sometimes people just keep objects in their support hand and they don't think about dropping those items to free that hand. When you do your training on the range and you go through other reality-based training, you should incorporate drills where you have objects in your support hand that you need to just automatically drop when the fight starts. That way you will train and condition your body to let go of things that you don't need so that you can have a better two-handed grip on your pistol when you need to go to that. Flashlights are replaceable. He could have very well just dropped it as he was running and then obviously find it later. But I suspect that adrenaline was pumping so hard with him, he just did not fully recognize or realize that he had the flashlight in his hand. Later on, he realizes he has it um, and he does put it away. But for this first initial encounter, the flashlight's in his hand. Now, at this point, um, he's obviously seen the guy has a gun, which is why his gun comes out. Um, <clears throat> now, we see that they believe the sound that you hear is the gun being thrown on top of the green dumpster and then falling off. In this moment, this officer may not have known what that sound was. There's the gun, plain as day. Let me see it. Get on the ground! 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 So, uh, little, little criminals like this, they've been around the system long enough to know you gotta have evidence. So this guy was clearly trying 
to hide evidence of the fact that he had a stolen firearm. But he's so stupid, just like all of them are, to think that he could just very blatantly, <laughs> in full view of this officer, just throw the gun over the fence and then say, oh, I have nothing, I have nothing, and think that that's going to play into him getting to leave or not catch charges or something like that. His behaviors in this interaction where he's non-compliant, he is, he defies all instructions, and he tries to control what's going on. This, in my opinion, is a direct result of uh, about three things. Two of them more so than the other. One of the contributing factors to this shithead behavior is his interactions with some other police and them not controlling the scene and controlling him and shutting his shit down when he starts throwing his temper tantrums. And I'll even back it up a little bit further. I'll say there's four contributing factors for why people act like this. <clears throat> and it all starts as when they're kids. So the school systems can no longer punish children. There's no more corporal punishment. I've been around criminals long enough to know that when they're at this stage in their criminal career, where they've got the face tats and they've, they're starting to be with the gangs, as kids, they don't they don't act right in school. They get a lot of dis disciplinary issues, and so he's he's gone through school acting stupid, and the teachers just can't rip him out of the chair and spank his little ass. So he builds up this complacency, so to speak, of being able to do what he wants, and there be no real repercussions. He probably lacks a father in his life, which is most of these criminals. They they either A, there is no father in their life, or the person who is the biological father in their life is not a good father figure. And it's usually mom or grandma who raises these little punks. When he gets to a certain size and age, Mama and Grandma can't tell him no anymore because he's too big and he's too violent for them to control. So then he starts doing what he wants when he wants. And when he gets to the to the stage of being involved in the juvenile justice system, um, usually in every state, that's a joke. And so he never learns anything there. Then when he becomes an adult and... Backing up, as he's a juvenile and police are dealing with him, a lot of times police will treat juveniles a little bit differently. They'll be a little softer with them. Uh, sometimes they'll catch them and release them right then and there because they don't want to do anything with them and they can't really do a whole lot of stuff with them. Uh, for example, here in Kentucky, if, uh, for example, a police officer catches a juvenile um, for burglary or something like that where they've broken into someone's house and stolen a gun, that officer cannot just immediately arrest that juvenile and take them to the tension. Yes, they can detain them and put cuffs on them, but they can't take them to the tension until they call what's called the court-designated worker. And that court-designated court worker basically works for um, the Department of Public Advocacy. So in the adult world, that would be the same as if the police arrest an adult and they have to call the public defender's office and say, hey, can we take this person to jail? And so when juveniles are arrested, they often have to call someone to get guidance or permission to take them to juvenile detention. And a lot of times that person they call just tells them to cite them and release them to parents. So the juvenile justice system is, is just about a huge joke when it comes to little gang members like this. So he's probably been caught for things as a juvenile and let go or caught for 
things as juveniles and the police decided not to take any legal action because they knew it's just going to be a big waste of time and he's going to get some sweet pretrial diversion deal and he's going to go on about his business and nothing nothing's ever going to come of anything then as an adult he may come across some police officers who don't control him don't control the same the scene and he kind of does what he wants that's one one little slice of the pie the other slice of the pie is when he does go into a detention setting he can mostly do whatever the hell he wants and there not be any huge repercussions in the juvenile setting it's most likely he could throw temper tantrums and do what he wants and there'd be no real consequences in the adult setting Yes, he can have some consequences the way he acts, but he will know how far he can take it. He will know he can throw a little bit of a temper tantrum and throw things around and know when those deputies or those guards, COs, whatever you want to call them, are about to go use force on him, and then he'll, then he'll stop, then he'll quit. That is pretty typical in the corrections world. Also in the corrections world, you have people who are hired who do not need to be working in those environments. They're a bunch of lame-ass pussies, for lack of a better terminology. They turn a blind eye to what's going on. Some of them bring contraband into these little shitheads. And they do not uphold the facility rules and procedures like they should. And so little buttheads like this can do what they want to some degree in jail and there not be any repercussions. Jails are typically a little bit more stricter than prisons and if he's been to prison then prison's a cakewalk for him because they pretty much let him do whatever the hell they want to do in prison. When it comes to the courts, the courts are pretty liberal and they let criminals out too often and too soon. So the reason why he is being so defiant like this and so blatantly stupid is because we have allowed him to act like this. And it's not just him. It's thousands of others of people who act like this. And it's our fault, our society's fault on why they act like this. Goes all the way back to their upbringing as, as kids. From there in the adult world, they do not receive... The proper consequences and they are not held accountable accountable the way they should be and so you get little shitheads like this who act just like this notice he's 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 controlling the scene right now he's dictating what's going on and he's even so comfortable in it that he's a he's adjusting his hat He's very adamant about he has nothing. Sometimes they'll they, they will they will get stuck on something like that and be very adamant that they are blah blah blah. He thinks in his mind, and I'm assuming that he thinks in his mind that because he's thrown this gun over the fence, he's probably not going to find it and he's going to get away with what he's got. The arguing stuff, him arguing with him and not complying, like I said, that goes back into society allowing him to act like this without any repercussions. I'm pleading, man. Get the ground, man. I'm pleading, dude. Another thing that I think that he was doing is he was setting himself up to continue to escape and evade. I think that he was trying to back... He knew he was in a corner. He couldn't go anywhere. I think that he was forcing the officers back <clears throat> so he could find an opening to run. And when you watch, you'll see his eyes dart around. His eyes are doing telegraphing uh, movements and he's looking for places to go to. So now the officer puts his flashlight away. 
on the ground, dude. I'm bleeding, bro, my leg. Here, get doctor. taser, get taser, get taser. Oh, You're gonna get tased. On my leg, dude. Get on the ground. Get on the ground or you're going to get tased. Now, he does have some distance between the this officer and this little fence over here. I do think that he was attempting to get himself in a position where he could run. But I don't think that he was actually really physically capable of doing it because of his leg injury where he got shot. There's two guns. There's one in the back. Ben, stay here, right there. So at this point, I don't understand, and this is another reason why these people start to act like this. In law enforcement, a lot of times people are given way too many chances. Like he has already been shot. He's caused this officer to have to shoot him because he's grabbing a deadly weapon. He's already told the other officer to tase him, The other, and he's been given verbal commands all the way up from his back corner to here, and the other officer was there and present for it. He gets his taser out, he gives him more commands, and then he announces he's going to tase him. That, that, that process has taken way too damn long. He should have tased his ass when he was already over there in the corner, or coming out of that corner. This whole delaying what needs to be done, trying to give them that chance to get down, is really just wasting time, and it's creating more problems later on down the road. This guy knows, because this is this is probably this kind of similar scenario where he's been given multiple commands and told multiple times, and told, stop, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to tell you one more time, and then they tell him, 20 more fucking times. He knows that this is this kind of standard thing that goes on in the police world with most officers. They'll just keep they'll just stand there and keep barking and barking like a little dog. His ass should have been already on the ground way before he ever got tased at this point. Oops. Fast forward. Get on the ground or you're gonna get tased. Alright. So he finally tases him. Good tasing. He locks up. He he has neuromuscular incapacitation. And if you listen closely, you can barely hear the taser cycling. You'll hear a very faint instead of the normal loud noise. If you listen very closely, you'll hear it. Give me your hands. Now, <laughs> the taser probe placements. Notice he has one in his left arm and bada bing, one in the head. This guy, <laughs> he is lights out. Um, this dude got jacked up. Sometimes that happens. Um, whatever. And for this guy, who cares? I don't, I don't give a shit when the probes hit him in the head. Uh, honestly, in my opinion, when he was picking up that gun, a bullet should have went in his head. Um, so the fact that a taser probe went in his head is, it doesn't bother me. Um, in fact, I kind of like it, to be honest with you. Now, I think that because he did get a taser probe in the head and the electric current gone through it, I think that he is... Uh, experiencing uh, spasticity right now where his body is spasming and his muscles are locking up from the electrical current that's just gone through his his head <clears throat> help me out with the arms give me your arms if you ever seen uh, people get hit really hard in the head punched really hard walk, walk whacked across the head with some object, whatever, um, and they fall, you can see those arms lock up. Um, that's where the muscles are, are spasming and, and tensing up. And I think this is this is what's occurring right now. Oh, yeah, 
You hear the taser again here in a second. There. So you can hear it right there. It's very faint. I'll replay it again here in a second, so listen for it. It's very faint in the background. And that, this is a good illustration, so to speak, or maybe an, an audio illustration of what the taser is supposed to sound like when you have good NMI. It should be, it should be quiet. I'm not going to say silent because it's not going to be silent, but the cycling of the pulses, it should be quiet. It shouldn't be very loud as if you were doing a spark test uh, to ensure that it's working. If it's as loud as um, when you shoot someone with a taser and it's as, as loud as when you do a, a spark test, that's obviously a, a huge sign that you don't have a good connection. When it makes that quieter cycling sound that's one sign that you have a good connection usually the visual of them falling and locking up and not moving or making the Chewbacca sounds is the other clear indication that you have a good connection but this is what the taser is supposed to sound like when you have a good connection and why is he tasing him as he's arresting him this is called arrest under power so in taser training, you can deploy taser on someone, and if they're still resisting, not putting their hands behind their back, you can give them additional cycles with the taser to essentially lock them up and make it where they can no longer control their limbs, and then you can pull their limbs, their arms behind them, and then cuff them. It's called arresting under power. Uh, I suspect that the other officer who did the tasing believes that this guy is resisting and not complying, not knowing that this guy has gone into um, spasticity and is just tensed up. It's just a, a misbelief on this officer's part. Either way, like I said, this dude brought it upon himself, um, so fuck him. So he rolls him around. <laughs> so he rolls him around a little bit, and this hat still stays on his head. So that means that that probe has obviously pierced through the hat and is in his skin of his skull. And the hat stays on as, he, as he's rolling him around. All right, get him up. We gotta get. All right. Get now this is just funny because this dude is knocked out cold. <laughs> he, he is asleep. Now this officer pulls a weekend from Bernie's kind of move and lifts him up and props him up in a sitting position as if he's awake and there's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. <laughs> this made me laugh pretty hard to see this little knocked out dude being propped up sitting there. 25. We got a gun over on the other side of this fence. Hey, we need another one. We have another gun on the other side of this fence. We have, we have another gun over here. Hey, man, we're getting you an ambulance, okay? Stay with us. The handgun Iriba threw over the... So going to the other guy's camera. Um, as I've said before, the reason why you don't hear any sound in the beginning is it's just the way the cameras are designed. Um, he has not hit the record button yet, and his camera is on a loop capturing images to be able to include um, up to, on default for Axon, it's 30 seconds. But you can extend that and make it two minutes, and I believe that's what Los Angeles police do is they make it a two minute so the camera captures things up to two minutes before you hit the record button. And this is what you're seeing. It's just the camera on standby mode. Now, one thing I've noticed watching a lot of these LAPD videos 
is these dudes, one, carry some freaking bricks for radios. I mean, their radios are just freaking huge. Um, I'm guessing that since you see the line right here, they use extended batteries um, on their radios. <sighs> Or they just have, I mean, ridiculously huge radios. I know, like, way, way back in the day, they had, like, those huge Astro radios. Um, and I'm guessing because they have to have more uh, programming in their radios, more channels, because they have so many districts or precincts or whatever. Um, but that's one. That's just one thing I've noticed about these LAPD videos is, one, their radios are, are freaking humongous. Um, they're, like, the size of bricks, and you could literally beat someone with a radio and secondly it's like none of them believe in shoulder mics or lapel mics you I, I don't think i can ever recall vividly seeing a video from lapd where patrol patrol dudes are using radios with the shoulder microphones they always are pulling their radio out in their left hand or right hand if they're a left-handed shooter and talking on it, and I don't, I don't understand that. I don't get that one. Um, it is a whole lot easier to have a shoulder mic where you can just reach up, press it, talk, and let go, and your hands are free. The way they do it is they have a radio in their hand, they got to talk on it, and now they got to put that radio away in a pouch. I don't like that method. Um, cause in the spur of the moment, if you get that radio in your hand and then you need to go to gun, either a, uh, you're going to be doing what the flashlight guy did. You're going to be coupling your radio hand to your gun hand and trying to get a jacked up two handed grip or you're going to drop that radio. And you really don't want to drop your radio cause that's your communication back to other people to get the cavalry on the way. If bad things are happening, if you haven't already said something on the radio to let them come and you've dropped that damn thing. Um, you, you might as well be in a, a foreign world at that point because no one's going to know what's happening to you. But that's just an observation I've made with the LAPD people. They don't, they don't like using shoulder mics and their radios are bricks. So he's been up behind him uh, since he got up to that corner. So he was here for the whole thing, and he's about to turn his camera on. You'll hear the sound come on here in a second. This probably would have been a good opportunity for him to put his gun away, get his taser out, and just tase his stupid ass. He's obviously already heard the gunshots at this point. Um, and can see the blood and hear the guy talking about he's bleeding and obviously not following any directions. It's not like he just came into this clueless about what's going on and, and is, you know, would be hesitant about wanting to use force. Like he already knows what's going on. He should have, in my opinion at this point, gone ahead and pulled taser and just popped his ass, but he didn't. Now watch him fiddle with the taser. Get on the ground! Get on the ground! So I don't know what he's doing with this taser. He looks like he fiddles with the cartridge. It looks like he's having trouble turning the safety off. Go back again. So I don't know what that was all about. Um, it's, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's just him full of ad adrenaline and so jittery that he's just fiddling with the taser um, or he just wasn't trained very well on the taser and that coupled with adrenaline, he's just fidgety and is 
jacking with it. I don't know what the heck he was doing with the taser, but he was obviously, it's like he was press checking the cartridge to make sure it was fully on there. Um, and it looked like he was trying to actuate the safety, take it off and went back down and he brought it back up. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what he was doing with it, but that was obviously something weird. I'm on taser. So you can hear from his camera the taser, and it's not very loud. And I'll go back and play that again so that you can hear it better. So that very faint cycling sound, that's what I'll talk about when... Uh, how the taser should sound when you have a good connection. There's going to be a vehicle. It's going to be a, a white Toyota Camry. Oh, yeah, it's additional. Um, they have call Myers and Curry suspects with a white Toyota Camry, license for Edward Ocean Lover 842. Here's another cycle. George 7, do you have an outstanding vehicle? I don't know if anyone, uh, Heathwind. All right, here comes the weekend from a, Bernie's move. Do you have it already <laughs> for avail? Uh, it's not fresh, not breathing. Uh, something for, uh, question We got a gun over on the other side of this fence. Hey, there, was a, there was a white car, and it parked up. Oh, like. You secure it? Yeah. Yeah. So, this dude is starting to go into a seizure. The officer holding him thinks that the other officer is delivering more cycles, taser cycles and tells him to lay off on it. Um, this is just a good, clear indication that uh, this dude's jacked up. Like, like he got... <laughs> he, he took a hell of a taser ride. Um, his body went into spasticity and now he's having a seizure. Um, as I said before, he brought that upon himself. Uh, so he got what he, he got what he deserved. Now, in all seriousness, um, instead of someone like this, who is, uh, obviously unconscious, um, it's in my opinion, not the best move to pull a weekend from Bernie's kind of move and prop them up, the best thing to do is just lay them on their side in what's called a recovery position or a lateral recumbent position. That way, their airway will be open and they can breathe easier. By sitting him up like this, his head is rolled forward and... Because of that, it is, in my opinion, able to slightly occlude your airway and make it difficult to breathe. And this could also be why he's shaking like this. He could be going through um, the shaking process that a body does when it doesn't have any air. Uh, the diaphragm will start violently um, working to try to get air into uh, the lungs, and you'll actually see this in hanging videos where people hang themselves or where people are hanged. Um, they will, they'll, of course, they'll struggle at the very beginning, and then once they go unconscious, you'll see the whole body just start like violently convulsing, and that's the that's the body trying to get air into the lungs. Um, and this could be what he's doing is or his body, what his body's doing, he's trying to get air in because his head is rolled so far forward like that, that it's just occluded his airway. Just think about being asleep in the car. Um, you know, you can have your head forward just a little bit, but if you roll it too much, you're, you're going to make obviously snoring noises and you're going to 
wake yourself up because you're not getting enough air in. Um, so the best thing to do for unconscious people is just lay them on their side, roll one leg, bring one knee up. If they're on their right side, you take their left knee and you pull it upwards um, in a way so that it prevents them from rolling all the way forward on their stomach and rolling all the way back on their back. Uh, that way they're on their side. That's the more optimal way for their airway uh, to be open and for uh, fluids to be able to uh, drain out and not go back into the airway and they asphyxiate on it. Not much else to say on this video. The biggest, uh, I guess, gripe that I would have is in the very beginning when he's chasing this guy, he sees the gun, knows he has a gun, um, and he has a flashlight in his left hand, and he keeps that flashlight with him um, for a good little bit during the initial stage of this when he shoots him and, and a little bit after when he shoots him that flashlight should have disappeared from his hand real quick either a put in the pocket or b just drop the damn thing and go on go find it later if it breaks replace it later oh well it's replaceable you as a person you're not replaceable as an employee, <laughs> you're replaceable. They'll just find someone else to take your spot. But you can't be replaced. Objects can. Things in your hand you don't need in a fight, drop them. Who gives a shit if they break? Um, went on a little bit of a rant on why little shitheads like this act the way they do. Um, and then talked about the taser. So, covered the things that I want to cover on this. Um, as far as him using the deadly physical force against this guy, nothing wrong with that. Uh, he did everything right uh, in terms of using deadly physical force when he was supposed to. Um, he did not violate this guy's rights in any way, in my opinion. Did not violate any constitutional rights whatsoever. Uh, this guy... He got what he deserved. He brought all this upon himself. <clears throat> That's all I have. If you like what you see, give me a like and a share. If you have not already, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Head on over to the Facebook page and do the same over there. Earl Henderson with Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching.